now the fallout from the Qantas data breach continues. Joining me live is Tech Guide editor Stephen Fennick. Fenno, uh, we'll get to the dramas at the Flying Kangaroo in just a tick. But first up, a new robot for Amazon. And you got yeah, the behind the scenes. Too. View I did, it. yeah, absolutely. I was a guest of Amazon up in uh, in Tokyo uh, earlier this week, and uh, yeah, I, the one millionth robot has been deployed at the fulfillment center in Chiba Minato, which is in uh, on the outskirts of Tokyo, and this is uh, like about six times larger than the the largest uh, fulfillment center here in Australia, Kemp's Creek uses similar robotic technology and it was a remarkable tour actually to see what just exactly what happens when you press that buy button on Amazon to see how the product gets to your doorstep and uh, the, the at the heart of it are these robots that it can guide all these pods, the storage pods to the pickers. Traditionally the old model of the fulfillment centre had a person walking to the shelves filling the basket with the orders, walking back to their station and, and putting them in boxes and envelopes and sending it out. Well, that's all changed thanks to the robotics because the pods, the, the storage shelves actually come to the pickers and it's uh, they're all guided uh, using this new AI platform called Deep Fleet that actually uh, optimises the path and makes sure there's minimal idle time and has improved the efficiency actually by up to 10%, which is huge when you consider the billions of packages that are delivered there uh, they're, they're through Amazon every single year. So from, from product coming into the, to the fulfillment centre to storage to picking to, to, to packing and sending, uh, it's a remarkably efficient setup they've got there. They've also opened up tours for that particular Tokyo fulfillment centre. Those tours already exist in Australia. The English-speaking countries were the first to get those. So if you're interested, you can actually book a free tour of the fulfillment centres up to 30 days in advance. And they always sell out too. It's, it's a fascinating look inside the uh, fulfillment centres and uh, it gives you an insight into exactly what happens when you click that buy button. Qantas still mopping up after the data breach. It's concerned a lot of people. Yeah, I was actually still in Tokyo when this broke, so I was uh, doing a lot of work on it and talking to people through at Qantas as well. Uh, they're still sifting through what exactly was was uh, taken. So the data that was that was stolen, they don't know exactly the 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 amount of data taken. They say six million exposed. That could be two million, three million. We we don't exactly know what uh, data. They've got an idea that it's probably your name, phone number. Uh, email addresses and things like that. They're being pretty transparent about it. I'm a Qantas customer. I've been getting regular emails and updates telling me that, yeah, my, my data might have been affected. Uh, but the thing, the thing for customers now is to, A, wait for more updates from Qantas so that when they get more information, but also, B, be on the lookout because if these hackers have your, your address, email address and phone number, you could potentially could be now the victim of even more phishing scams, mess, uh, scam messages, because they know you're a Qantas customer. They could craft some scam around travel, and so we, we've got to be a bit vigilant there. Uh, also, too, they have a, a number that you can call, a, a, a free number that can also put you in touch with uh, identity specialists. So if you're worried that you, you, the information compromise may compromise your identity, so for, to facilitate identity theft, you can can actually talk to someone to see what to look for, see what you can do right now. But at the moment, it's still a waiting game to see exactly what data has been taken and just the sheer, the full extent of, uh, of the breach. And 20 years of podcasting, that went quick. Yeah, 20 years ago, it was, uh, well, in late 2004, there was a, a thing called audio blogging where people thought, you know what, I'm going to record something and make it accessible on the internet. It wasn't until 2005 when Apple decided to update their iTunes. It was iTunes 4.9 from memory back in June 2005 that allowed you to discover, download and listen to your, your, your podcast. And you got to remember, this was at the height of the iPod popularity. So so hence the name. The name was coined by a journalist. The, the, the term podcasting was, uh, was coined by a Guardian journalist back in 2004. So, uh, yeah, 20 years on, it's become a massive platform. And I know I've got four podcasts myself, so I'm, I'm deep in the, in the ecosystem. So uh, it has become very popular now. All kinds of subjects and, and topics that people are listening to, consuming podcasts, uh, tens of millions of listens uh, daily. Yeah, absolutely. Good on you, Fenno. Good to chat. I won't talk, talk about sounds because you're struggling. Let's hope, mate, we can turn it around tomorrow. <laughs>
Oh, it's grim. All right, thank you for that.